I just didn't want my ego. I wanted to strip myself from all of that. It's not the reason why I got into martial arts. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 230. Today we're bringing you another wonderful guest from down under, Sensei Sasha Rayburn. I want to thank you for tuning in. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and I'm the one that helps guide our company as we make all of the wonderful sparring gear, apparel, services, web products, all the amazing things that we've got going on. And you can find links to everything we do at whistlekick.com. If you're looking for the show notes for this or any other episode, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you're not on the newsletter, you should be. We send out one, maybe two newsletters a month. We don't spam you. We, we just kind of hit you with the high points. You know, a, a podcast episode or two, maybe a new product, new color of gear, just something that we've got new rolling out. We have new things coming all the time. If you guys could see my workspace with all the new products that we've got going, whew, it is crazy over here. The best way to find out when any of those things roll out, the newsletter list. And we tend to offer some pretty big discounts not just on the existing products, but when stuff first hits. Because we want to get some feedback. We want to know what you all think. You can find the social media for everything we do at Whistlekick. We're everywhere you might imagine. And we've even got this kind of super secret, not really Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio behind the scenes. And that's where we have some great discussion about the episodes. If you're a certain age, it's almost a guarantee that you spent some hours, maybe a lot more, playing the video games Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter. Today's guest is no different. Sensei Sasha Rayburn was first exposed to martial arts through video games, and it was those experiences that led her onto the martial path. Today, she practices Taekwondo as well as the art of capoeira. She's also an actress who started training as a child and recently received an award for one of her series. Sensei Rayburn has an interesting story on how she got into the martial arts, so without further ado, let's welcome her. Sensei Rayburn, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It is an honor to have you here. Try oh, number two, if we can, if we can call it that. You know, we got we got bit by time zone math. Yeah, the first, yeah, the we first did. time. Which anybody <laughs> oh, it that happens. it does anybody that has friends yeah. or family overseas knows time zone math can be quite a pain, and then and then you, you get daylight savings time and. Yeah, and, oh. and we are we're a day ahead here in Australia, and that just gets confusing for the rest of the world. It's 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 difficult yeah do, do you do you feel like you're ahead of the world in australia do you, do you feel like you're watching everything go on and say oh they're just catching up to us <laughs> oh, no, not really not no but you'd sometimes if you do have friends that are waking up on on facebook from the other side of the world you you and you, there's sometimes a time difference where you're like oh we're a day ahead <laughs> yeah that seems like a politically correct answer i'll take it <laughs> <laughs> well done well done <laughs> All right. Well, we're we're not here to talk about Facebook or time zones or or anything like that. We're here to talk about martial arts and specifically your journey yeah. through the martial arts, which you know, I've been watching on social media for a little while and and you've got some cool oh, stuff going you. on and Oh, you, oh thank you so much. Oh, you're, thank you. I'm a, I'm a big yeah. fan of you. You know, I've listened to some of your podcasts and I think you're great and I always learn so much whenever I listen to you. Well, um so this is the end of the episode. We've we've reached the peak. I mean, there's no no reason to go forward. <laughs> it's all downhill from here. No. Let's let's talk about how you got started. You know, every, everybody's yeah, sure. journey has to start somewhere. So, what about yours? How did you get started in the martial arts? Okay. Well, yeah. Firstly, where I grew up as a child in Australia, it was a very small town in country New South Wales. And I had two brothers. And so um, uh, we were really into playing video games. And some of those video games were Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter. And um, we would play them all day long. And my mom didn't really have <laughs> much of a limit. And so I was actually exposed to martial arts through those video games. And I just wanted to be like Ken or Ryu. And, but it was just that these characters and being such a kid, like I'm talking, you know, five or six years old, and seeing these, these characters just come from different um, martial art backgrounds. Like, you know, I would see um, uh, E. Honda from like a sumo background, Saget from, from Muay Thai. And, you know, the, you don't, uh, being in a small town, there were actually no karate or martial art classes or anything like that. 
I um I learn a lot just from watching the movements of those video games. And my but my brothers, they were a bit more stuck in the virtual world of it. Whereas I would take it outside and I would be on the trampoline and I'd be pretending I'm like Chun Li going pa 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 doing these movements. Um and yeah, I would get into fights with my brothers. I was a bit of a country kid and I didn't like dolls. I had a doll phobia. I, I was a bit of a tough girl. I, I wanted, I would much rather play someone around at Street Fighter or, or Mortal Kombat than, than be given a doll. And my mum would have to sort of give me lectures before birthday parties like, you know, you are a girl and people are going to give you dolls and uh, that kind of thing. So that's the type of you know, young girl I was. And um, so, like I said, there weren't really any martial art classes in that town. But when we moved to a bigger town, um, we moved up to the Gold Coast in Australia. Um, I, I did my first Taekwondo class when I was around 13 years old. But before then, I had done a lot of dance. Uh, there was dance in that small town. And so um, I, you know, that's where I learned a lot about flexibility, footwork, rhythm, um, and I also had a gymnastic partner at school and we would muck around doing cartwheels and splits and sort of push ourselves. Um, yeah, but so yeah, we did my first Taekwondo class about 13. And, um, then when I moved to, and I, I loved it, I was hooked, um, uh, in the first class, but when I started to want to, to want to take it seriously. And so, um, when I moved then to Sydney, I actually, bumped into somebody who I, um, who, who had, I was working in like, I guess you guys would have, it's called Macy's. We call it Maya here. And so I, I had to pay for my martial art training. You know, my, my parents didn't pay for it for me. I had to, um, you know, have a part-time job and pay for it for myself, but it was something that I really wanted to do. And, um, I bumped into, uh, a one-on-one personal coach who did Taekwondo and um, I would spend my money that I that I earned from the you know the Macy's the retail and Maya store, and um, pay for one on one classes, and uh, I've and I felt that I could get a better better training that way because in the group class I I would get a bit lost as a student and so that was really um, my journey then was one on one coaching um, with the with the Taekwondo coach yeah, and but he had. Um, he told me that he couldn't grade me. So he would have to take me down to his master. And so I had the best of two worlds. Then I had the group training and I had the one-on-one training. And then I went up through the ranks, uh, through that master. Yeah. So that's kind of how I got into it. But the style that I was, um, that I, that I was doing was not ITF, was not WTF. It was a sort of a hybrid style, like it was an Australian Taekwondo and they, it was a reputable club, but it was not under those two, uh, two bands. So, um, uh, later on, um, and just recently I, I regraded for Black Belt under WTF. Okay. You're used mm. to getting that question. It seems, you know, which, which <laughs> division, of Taekwondo. Yeah, was it? yeah, like and the, I was oblivious because I was quite young and I was quite oblivious to um to what style I was doing. I was just happy to go through uh the ranks. Um but yeah, that um particular club as Australian freestyle Taekwondo was not uh yeah, was not ITF or WTF which later on be- kept, has become important to me especially recently because I want to compete. And um so uh yeah, just just Recently, I, I switched to a different club with a master that um, could grade me under cookie one. But, um, you know, I had such great time with those two two masters. And one of those masters is very good friends with Benny the Jet. And so I actually got to train and oh, still cool. do. And he comes to Australia once a year, get to train with Benny the Jet. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. A, and a um, legend. For any of you out there that don't know Benny the Jet or Kidez, you should look him <laughs> yeah. up. He's... I mean, just an, just an absolute legend back in in the kickboxing days. Yeah, and he's a legend to to train with as well. He he really takes this training to a spiritual, um, yeah, to a whole different spiritual dimension. He he talks about uh, reconditioning the mind and reconditioning your childhood beliefs. Um, and he kind of he subconsciously programs his students like um, while he's training. Like he, it's like he brainwashes, but in such a positive way where he reconditions your mind that you really feel like you can do anything. And a lot of martial art actors that have trained with him, uh, you know, will, will 
practice a few movements within a few days and they can do a spinning crescent or a spinning back kick, you know, because he, he has that uh, hip, hypnotizing effect mm, on you. Cool. Mm. Yeah. But um, with those two um, uh, masters and that I trained with, uh, I was actually only the first woman to receive a black belt in the club. And so even when I go down to the club and revisit it now, I'm like on the big, I'm outside on the big uh, uh, bill, you know, poster for when you come in, like on the big sign <laughs> up the top. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, oh, wow, they, you know, it's um, a big part of the club that were, I was the first woman to go through because it was a really – blokey bloke kind of guy sort of like lots of guys um you know training that with this van damme type of you know or inspired guys that um beat each other up and you know i was inspiring with these guys and they and they they thought a lot of me that i was the first woman that came in and i think changed th- changed things up and showed that you know women could could, could do it <laughs> sure. yeah but i used to call um the one-on-one coach that I, there's a bit of a story there because i I actually kind of convinced him to train me. Um, what happened was, like I said, you know, I was coming from the small town, not having martial art classes, doing a bit in one town, but then going to the big city and knowing I wanted to do one-on-one type of coaching. Um, and then when I met him in the retail store with his friend and his friend talked him up, his coach, he had he was hesitant about training me because he didn't really have any – he didn't have any private students at that point. It was something he wanted to retire from. So I, I just was just saw it as a, as an omen. I know it was, I convinced him. I was like, no, this is a sign. You have to train me. You don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> and he just, from my will and my passion, he actually said, oh, okay, and took me under his wing and sort of slowly admitted that it was because he was sort of was starting to not lose his passion but um, was weaning off a little bit martial arts. And he admitted that I did come in at the right time to just reinvigorate that passion. Um, yeah, so, and oh, I used to call cool. him in my mind, I used to call him Zangief <laughs> because, <laughs> because he, um, he was a big guy and uh, he reminded me of Zangief and I, I used to think to myself, don't be scared because the way we as kids used to fight Zangief was go to the corner and, and, and kick him in the head. <laughs> there was a trick to the game. Um, and so I, cause it's scary uh, being such a lightweight and being a woman and going up against any really big guy, it is scary. And so I used to sort of say to myself, it's just Zangief. There'll be a trick to any big guy, you know? And so I used to say them back in my mind, but this is the great thing about the story is that he used to say to me, don't like when I couldn't push him back and I didn't have power he used to say, um, don't be scared, like really push me back um, because the bigger they are, the heavier they'll go down. It says don't be threatened by size. And I learned that very young to realise that um, a bigger opponent is heavier and they will be heavier to go down, um, not as quick to get to get up. And um, so that was always something to be encouraged by. Um, but, yeah, he was very um, – he used to give me homework and it was to watch Jean-Claude Van Damme movies because <laughs> he swore by Van Damme's technique, even though he was a big guy. And um, But he swore by his technique. He said he had a – the way he raised his knee so high – um, was what I should be aiming for in every kick. Um, and he said that he used to, <laughs> he used to um, play um, <laughs> play his scenes and, and slow-mo the, um, uh, the, the spinning back kicks, uh, spinning hook kicks, and say, this is what you want to achieve. Like, and this would be in the middle of a training session. He'd be like, no, 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 and he'd go over to Van Damme. And so um, – and then I, you know, watched these movies and became a fan myself of Bloodsport and Kickboxer. Um, yeah, wow. so the Van Damme is a, is a really big part of my <laughs> training journey. You're, and you're not the only one. I mean, certainly not the yeah. first time Van Damme has been mentioned on the show. And we've had others talk about the influence that the, the movies of that era. And if you were coming up in, in the 80s, Van Damme was the guy. I mean, those right. movies like were my, a step was, beyond. Yeah. Mm. And, and I feel very, yeah, blessed and fortunate that he introduced me to all of that. Yeah, um, because it, it, he also explained to me that 
um, flexibility, like Van Dam uh, accentuated, fle- you know, flexibility. And um, he was had a ballet background. My coach told me that he had a ballet background and that. said that that that's um you know he has a grace to his kicks he's very light on his feet and da 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 you know you want to get that da 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 like um be able to put your put your kicks out there and just be able to um um double kick triple kick and so he used to give me these really hard com- combos and with leg weights too and so he uh, he was quite and then he had the Zangief uh, statue so he was my first coach and I, I really did learn a lot from him. Mm. And then um, while I was on this black belt journey, um, I, I, in the back of my mind, and I was kind of going out there um, and, and doing different martial arts um, while I, cause I, I just, like I said, I, you know, I, I was drawn to all of the different backgrounds of all, you know, martial arts, like wanted to learn everything. So I did a bit of Wing Chun. I learned a little bit of Aikido and, um, but I didn't want to confuse myself too much. I didn't want to go and get my black belt, but in the back of my mind, I, 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 as soon as I got to first Dan, I actually wanted to go to white belt in something. And that was a big part of my martial art journey. I didn't want to, because I mean, I could walk in there and people were about, people would bow to me because I got my first Dan and I was the only woman. So, you know, I had a lot of credibility in the club, but I actually wanted to, I just didn't want my ego. I wanted to strip myself from all of that. It's not the reason why I got into martial arts. I didn't want people to, uh, to have that attitude towards me. I always wanted to be the hungry one and always wanted to go back to white belt and start fresh and be the fool all over again. So I actually went to white belt in Capoeira and, um, and then stuck that out for five or six years, oh, um, okay. and still do Capoeira and, um, got my, my blue red belt in that martial art. And that's, that's, you know, a big part of now me as a martial artist is that I'm also a Capoeirista. And um, then, then when I went back to sparring, then I went to revisit my club, you know, now and then along the journey with the capoeira skills. Oh, the sparring skills just went to a different level mm. knowing capoeira. Yeah. I did a because few it... years of capoeira and oh, the, my, nice. my, the, my favorite thing that I pull out of that, the thing that most martial artists struggle with is staying, is, is that linear, that front back, front back. And they struggle with right, moving to exactly. the side, and so I'll, I'll work yes. Jenga with folks to to get them to see. Here's how you can start to move laterally, and, and seeing the opportunities there. And, yes. it, and of course, and it's just so much fun. The music and yes, the music, getting the vibrations. Um, um, but yeah, you're right. The Jenga and being able to yeah move, get so much ground and move. And when you look at people like martial arts, like Bruce Lee, I almost think Bruce Lee was doing the Jenga, like, <laughs> you know, um, um, and Muhammad Ali, you know, they, I always feel like, did they do a bit of capoeira? Because they're just, they're moving a lot so much like the Jenga. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool stuff. Yeah. We don't have, we've had a couple people on the show that have done capoeira, uh, but they did it in Brazil or brought it from Brazil. So you're, you yep. are our yeah, first um, international yeah. capoeirista. Well, yeah, the, um, the, the instructor that I learned under, he's like a, an authentic grandmaster from Brazil. He's, um, it's Capoeira Brazil is the name of the group and they're, yeah, very well known. And so I did have that authentic, um, Brazilian experience because there's actually a lot of the Capoeira clubs here in Sydney, um, they are Brazilian. And they do teach that, you know, that authentic Brazilian um, style. So we're very fortunate. Cool. Capoeira seems to be, you know, over the last probably five, ten years where karate was in the in the 60s. Right. You know, that just yeah. Kind of that, that first generation, that first wave. And it'll be interesting to see where it goes over the next mm, 10, Yeah, I hope years. it gets into the Olympics one day. That would be so cool. <laughs> that, that would that would be awesome. Well, we, we just, yes. we're just getting karate in there. And I don't know if they're going to give us another <laughs> yeah. martial art. It I mean, would take a long time for Capoeira, I, I think, to be in there. Yeah. I would be fine with an Olympics full of martial arts. I mean, let's get rid of, um, I don't know, all, all the dumb ones that don't need to be there. Yeah. And I'm not going to name them because I'll offend someone. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an origin story. I mean, man, we we, we bounced. We, we, we saw a lot in there and... You now hold the title of most Street Fighter references on the show of anybody. <laughs> um, I know I was going to say just... Christy from Tekken with the capoeira, like because um, she's my favorite character yeah. from Tekken. 
Mm. Like, <laughs> Actually, I can some just... people on my Instagram, whenever I do Capoeira, they go, oh, Christy from Tekken. And I'm like, <laughs> I must admit, whenever I see that, I'm like, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> I could just see you out, out in the backyard, you know, trying to figure out, is this how I do the hundred hand slap? Right. Can I make my hands <laughs> yeah. go that fast? <laughs> yeah. But it's a great, sometimes like to, to imagine yourself as a video game character, sometimes before training, um, it's just a great imaginative way to, uh, um, to, 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 to take yourself out of being human. Cause sometimes I think, um, thinking of yourself as a human and you've got this certain amount of breath, you're, all, you're already talking yourself out of, uh, the possibility of being superhuman, right? Like by just going, oh, you know, I've got to train and I've got, you know, I've got to have a certain amount of energy. Whereas you're like, well, I just see myself as a video carrying character and you just visualize yourself like that. Um, you can get a lot of stamina just by doing that. Yes. It's a wonderful visualization <laughs> and it's actually one that I'll use when I'm teaching children oh, to get wow. them to see themselves yeah. as superheroes or video game, excuse me, video game characters. It can really exactly. help them dial into what's possible rather than what they rather know. Rather than your own, already. yeah, rather because we, yeah, you tend to sort of like see ourselves in a limited way of just like, oh, ordinarily human. But at least you're using your imagination and you're opening yourself up to the possibility that you are, you know, you're, you're extra, you know, su you're superhuman. Right. Mm. Let's move and on. The, you, the, uh, what was that? Go ahead. Nope. Finish it, finish oh, and the, yeah, the idea that you don't have breath, you know, that was brought up in the Matrix as well. I think when Morpheus just said to Neo, um, is that air you're breathing, you know, and I think he had that moment where he's like, hmm, you know, this just gave him something to think about. Like, maybe it's an illusion. Maybe it isn't a, like the whole idea that you have a certain amount of breath. How much is, is of that is psychological? How much of that is just you? assuming that you only have a certain capacity. And so, yeah, using sort of um, uh, the virtual re reality to maybe sort of put yourself outside, um, the yeah, the, the idea of just being human is, is at least helping that area of imagination. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about stories. I mean, you just, you just yeah, told sure. us a bunch. I mean, that, that's really – I love stories and, and really – almost everything that happens on this show is just a, a sequence of stories. Some are shorter than others, some are longer than others. Yeah. If I ask you for your favorite martial arts story, what would that one be? Hmm. My favorite martial arts story. I, I have a lot. Um, I, th I definitely do value, um, my travel time to training, especially in the early days. Um, you know, I had to, uh, catch a train for an hour and a half to get to my my one-on-one -on -one coach <laughs> and uh, those early mornings and, and then having a run to get there and um, I think the time on the train I would just fall asleep <laughs> and then miraculously just wake up a stop before I had to get off and and know I had to train but um, I do value um, the, the the and I say to uh, people studying at martial arts who go oh you know I, I have so much time, time, you know, I live far away. And I think that's something to be said in the travel time to get there. To me, it really was part of the training is a part is a mental part to um, switch off and, um, and to go into drink to a dream world, if you like, and um, to just soak in the, the, the messages you might receive or the spiritual, the spirituality of your journey. It's not always about the outcome and getting a six pack, you know, I think sometimes people focus on that, but just also, um, uh, allowing yourself to be on, um, a meditative journey while you're training. So I value the time that I've spent traveling to where I've got to got to get to, um, training, but, and also meeting, um, uh, Benny the jet. That's been a great story. Um, i really enjoy and still do, and I have his books and, um, and, and, and it's still always in the back of my mind that Benny, he, he explains when he's, um, teaching that if someone gives you a hit and you felt it, you know, um, it's important at that moment to look at that, your opponent in the eye, look at that person in the eye and say, that was a good kick <laughs> with a lot of genuine emotion about that. And the reason why is because you're teaching yourself that you can handle it. And I always thought that was a very special 
um, uh, teaching that I, I've learned and a very special story that I always still to this day put that ego aside. If I've felt a really good hit where it did scare me a little bit, it's so important more than ever to really look at that person and say that was a good kick and that was a good hit because each time you're doing that, you're psychologically reprogramming yourself that you're stronger than you think you are and that you can handle it. Um, so, yeah, that would, that would be probably – some some stories that um yeah that i can think of all right what are you doing when you're not mm. doing martial arts what else you got going um on? yeah well acting has been like my number one pursuit um even before martial arts came along like when i was six in my first school play i decided that i wanted to be an actor and i took up training very young and i moved to sydney and went to nida where a lot of the famous um, at Aussie actors would go. It's a very f- a famous school here. Um, Kate Blanchett went there along, among other Australian actors. And, um, yeah, I, re- I recently received uh, my honours in acting at another university. So that's been keeping me busy. And um, in 2013, I actually moved to L.A. and I wrote, directed and starred my own web series called Lost in L.A., which uh, some people on social media were following me in that part of the journey. And, that went on to win like a string of awards at film festivals and that came as a surprise. But I, I learned that I really like comedy out of all of that. Um, and now I'm sort of working on martial art projects where I can intertwine some of the things I learned about comedy and acting. Um, that's for the direction I'd really like to go more than anything is to be able to uh, incorporate comedy and martial arts. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah. In, in, what, in what way? Do you have any ideas that you're willing to share? <laughs> uh, yeah, like, well, I I definitely envision myself as an actor being able to play those um, um, those those traditional karate kid kind of roles, like where you know, there's a um, there's a calling to do martial arts, or there's something that's that's propelled the um, the character to to do martial arts and. Um, seek out the sort of training and it's a quirky you know interesting master and um uh, there's some 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 life lessons to go along there or have to go into competition you know the whole that whole blood sport or kickboxer type of um uh, story or karate kid sort of story but I would like to see it with a bit more of a Jackie Chan kind of uh spin or just a bit more of a humorous side um and Britain bridge yeah bridge across a bit more of a woman doing comedy and martial arts um, more than, uh, more than the serious type of, uh, as much as I love films like million dollar baby, but yeah, I think that there's, there'd be room for, um, a martial arts actress that would can take on that comedic side a bit more, you know, I, th- I haven't seen that too much in the Western, um, c- cinema or, you know, film projects. So I think that would be really cool. Yeah. It, it's, it's something that, I would love to see more. Of course, I, I want to see more martial arts in every stage of life, every <laughs> representation in popular culture. Of course, you know, when, when people talk about martial arts and comedy, we're generally talking about one thing, you know, it's Master Ken. You know, mm, it, 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 yeah. Pretty much the the place and, and, you know, people will come through and, and work with him, but he's kind of the guy and... You know, I, I can't speak to how well he does, but he's well known. So, yeah. oh, so certainly yeah. that that tells me there's probably room for more. And yeah, yeah, there's a um, yeah, there's a lot of guys like in martial arts, and they they can get status status quite quickly in the martial art genre. Um, you know, whether it's even you know, there's like you've got even actors that aren't serious competitors in martial arts like your Matt Damon's or Keanu Reeves you know they've got their 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 franchise films and um that but a woman who's an actress will might do like for instance you know, Uma Thurman might do one or two like martial art films but you know they they aren't really martial artists to begin with so they have a lot more interests in um in in other avenues of course um whereas I would really like to just focus on a career that would be um martial art comedy I'd be happy to do something like um Jackie Chan like just own in on a specialty and after doing Lost in LA and 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 discovering that I really like comedy um that would be something that I would really like to focus on yeah cool all right yeah I'd, I'd like you to tell us about 
a difficult time. You know, we, we all have them. We all have these challenges, rough stuff. But martial artists yeah. seem to have a unique ability to get through them either either faster or with more grace or whatever it is. So I'm hoping you might tell us about a tough spot in your life and how you were able to use your martial arts in some way to get through. Yeah, sure. Well, just recently um, having – having um... I, I, I went I went out of my comfort zone and did uh, my honours at university and that was something that I just thought, oh, that's what other people do. You know, other people go and work on a thesis and, um, you know, become professors or eventually, you know, do that type of thing. That's not – that wasn't me. And so I think I had this sort of limited view of myself that, oh, I'm not going to be able to get through this course or something. And it did get tough there where I did – almost have a meltdown halfway through during this thesis. I was like, I can't do this. Um, and I did draw upon my martial arts background and always, always find that I do. You're right. And um, I did, I did sort of see it as something where my training has taught me never to, never to give in, never to give up, but to something about pain, you know, pain is, martial arts has taught me that um pain is temporary as well like it it might last you know a minute it might last a day it might last you know a year but it is it will subside you know and something else i think uh, starts to take its place um and and that's usually success <laughs> and so i think that during that tough time i just I, I had I, I drew upon that. I went, well, it's like a training session, you know. This is um, this is pain, and and now is the time where I really have to use my martial art training because a training session might be over in, you know, two two hours or something, or you know, long three hours. Um, but you know, this is this is a bit longer. So this is when you really do need to draw upon that martial art training, and um, I just I, I I sort of saw it that it was it was like it was like a test it's like a martial art test and that um i started using some of the tactics that i would do in martial arts like maybe hey maybe i'm putting too much pressure on myself maybe i need to sort of take a break or you know relax like sometimes in your stance in martial arts you realize you've got too much tension and that's why you're burning out you need to relax and so i would think to myself okay it's time to time to relax, time to, to breathe in, but always just looking ahead and looking at my, my opponent or looking at the, looking at the, the task in front of me and, um, um, and, and having a determination about, um, about, uh, about succeeding and sort of enjoying it and maybe not worrying about the outcome. I think with good fights and we're, like we saw with Mayweather and, and McGregor just recently, you know, it's, I think after that fight, people started to realize it wasn't really about winning or losing. I mean, look at McGregor. He went out of his comfort zone. He did something. That's an achievement already. And Mayweather coming out and, and giving that um, a 50 to nil um, a shot and, you know, succeeding at that, that they're, they're, that's sort of what it's, it's, it's more about. It's not about this pettiness of like, you know, who had the, the hardest hit in that particular round. Like it was sort of, in a way, it was kind of like, equal is sort of like um balanced you know um him being an mma fighter and having those first rounds which were quite quite like you know um different and then mayweather you know having his his limelight like it all sort of balanced out and i think that we tend to focus so much on the outcome but i think my martial art training is has taught me that it's not it's not about you know winning and losing it's about the character it's about staying in the fight and you know doing the best you can and um and uh, and understanding that pain is your friend. <laughs> it certainly can be and a wonderful instructor. Mm. I mean, yeah. Really, I think if you get right down to it, you can break most of what we learn, what we learn by experience as avoiding pain, whether it's physical pain or emotional pain or you know, we tend to learn those lessons, hopefully. Some of us Yeah. Do. Yeah, and I do notice that, um, especially in stretching, because as I said before, you know, I came from that um, background where my coach really um, stressed the importance of, of, of stretching and the Van Damme background and everything. And I notice that's when um, a lot of people and I, 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 in the class, in the classes that I'm doing at the moment, will tend to drop off a little bit or people think, associate stretching with yoga and that it should be, I don't know, that it should be relaxing. People have this false idea that stretching should be relaxing. Yes, it can be, but 
really effective stretching is you do feel the pain, you know, and, and you, but you learn to enjoy the pain. You don't learn, you don't, you learn to see the pain as something that is actually an inviting experience. It's inviting you to understand that you're, you're, you're only making the experience more painful because you're resisting the, the abundant feeling of being better. You know, that's where ironically the pain's kind of coming from is because, you know, you're, you're resisting what you could be and you're wanting to limit yourself here. Like I see when people stretching and I'm stretching people out, they want to, they just limit themselves by seeing themselves here and that they're making the pain almost worse, um, by, by, by sort of capping themselves right there and not seeing themselves expand. That makes it worse. So pain is interesting because I think it's, we, we, we add to it, you know, whereas if I think if we surrender, I mean, relax, stretching is a perfect example, just surrender, just the more you relax, the, yeah, you'll feel a bit of pain, but just relax into it. We're, you know, just in, invite it in <laughs> and um, experience the, experience the pleasure of pain. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. I'm not even going to try to summarize it or expand upon it because I would ruin it. So we'll just move oh. forward. Let's yeah, let's talk sure. about the people that you've worked with. You know, you, you've yeah. you've mentioned this first instructor several times. You know, the, these private lessons, this mm. you know, really seemingly ordained from beyond student meets master <laughs> kind of moment. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that was a maybe that had to happen for you because of the influence of the movies and the video games, and, and you needed to live your own. But if we take yeah. him out, if we take him mm -hmm. out and I say, who's been the most influential person on your martial arts? Who would it be? Oh, yeah. Um, well, it's interesting. Like my, of course, my, my loved ones, my family and those closest to me without a doubt. But I, um, it's interesting. I compile these MP3 tracks for my iPod, which have been very influential and some of them are I've been listening to for years and some of the speakers on these tracks include Eric Thomas and Les Brown, which are two amazing motivational speakers. Yes. Um, and I don't know if you've heard of them or not, but oh, they, absolutely. yeah, yeah, they, they, especially Eric Thomas. I, and I got to meet him in real life. Oh, um, cool. I, I was crying and crying, crying. Cause like, even when I made my own web series and that moved to LA, big steps in my life, um, a lot of it was due to listening to some of his motivation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, thank God it's Monday. And um, something about him, like I've listened to Tony Robbins and people like that before, but nothing really resonated with Eric Thomas, something about his passion. I just watch the guy and something just triggers inside of me that I've, you know, whether it's a purpose or some, you know, some passion. And then Les Brown as well. And, um, but along with those motivational speakers are Bruce, is Bruce Lee, of course, and listening to he, him talk and be like water and the speech and that. And got that on a loop. And there's Arnold Schwarzenegger on there. But my favorite, though, is Muhammad Ali. I think because his amazing voice and um, he has a, such a rhythm and tone in his voice and he rhymed. And listening to that, like, gets into my um, subconscious because I'm, I really like, I'm interested in it in, as a martial artist to re always like in the Benny the Jet training, just reprogramming myself. So I'll listen to like last week I murdered a rock, injured a stone, hospitalized a brick. I'm so mean, I make medicine sick fast, fast. Last week I cut the light off in the bedroom, hit the switch, was in the bed before the room was dark. George Foreman, I love this part because he's like, George Foreman, I know you got him. I know you got him picked, but the man's in trouble. I'm going to show you how great I am. But, yeah, the reason why I love Muhammad Ali because he had that, like, up and down in his pitch. And, um, and he, you know, he was, the, he was the underdog with George Foreman, so he was just like, I know you got him. I know you got him picked, but the man's in trouble. I'm going to show you how great I am. I think just, like, his words just resonate with me and make – like just ascend me to a different level, you know, and same with Bruce Lee and like all those people I just mentioned, I think it's about getting out of, getting out of your um, um, surroundings. Like we surround ourselves with like, you know, people in everyday situations, but we don't realize how much we are collecting in our auras and how much that affects us. And 
you know, we've got to, as martial artists, like clear ourselves almost like a yogi, you know, and I find listening to these people and getting into their or getting into the, their orbit kind of, kind of like shifts me up at a different gear, a different frequency. Yeah. One of my favorite sayings is, you know, and different people say it in, in different ways, but you are the average of the people that you spend the time with. Yeah. So I mean, if you're surrounding yourself with great people, but it's true. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, it, it's it. It will. There are plenty of people I've shared that with that it rocked them back on their heels and they got super mm. defensive because yep. they recognize. Yep. I think we all recognize consciously. So here you are. You're talking about these motivational, powerful, <laughs> inspirational people, and you know yeah, I'm yeah. I'm very familiar with Eric Thomas. When I'm having a day mm. where I need to get stuff done, my <laughs> when you want to breathe T-shirt comes out of the drawer. And it goes yeah, on yeah. because yeah, that, and, mm -hmm. the, the, the first hundred times I, I heard him give that, I probably had tears. It is, yes, it is incredibly you. powerful. Yes. And for anybody yes. that, that doesn't know Eric Thomas, you should definitely check him out. He has nothing to do with martial arts other than he is incredibly passionate and motivated. And yeah, there's something I, I, I there's, and when I saw him live as well and um, I was up so close and like the th the third row and got to, as soon as he just came to the room and somebody um, who had seen him before live and we were just quickly talking before he came out said, you're going to cry. And I said, oh, no, I'll be all right. And they're like, no, you're going to cry. And as soon as he came out, I just started crying because just, just him being in the room and having heard all of those um Thank God it, it's Mondays and um, and uh, all of the podcasts and, you know, and listening to him. Um, and he just, it, I, what I love about him, I think, because he, he meditates and he, he's a big believer in God and talks to God. He has conversations to God and he ascends, he goes outside of this world and, you know, brings in the message message for people and then has the, the, the courage and, and feels the, the, the fire in his belly to just say it how it is, like however – However it comes out in whichever way it's going to come across to you. And I think that something about, yeah, just stripping his all of his um, his masks and uh, stripping all of his um, ego in order to just reach the person. He doesn't care about anything else. It's just more, more important, you know. And I think that um, that's the reason why we train, you know, because – when we're or at the bank in the queue, like feeling frustrated, you can't let out the key up or shout, you know, like it, we, we live in such a polite, you know, we have to be so polite, but really, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're primitive. We, we, you know, see kids and um, babies, you know, they scream and they let it out and like, we're no, we're no different, but we've become very numb sometimes. And like, yeah, we collect everything that surrounds us um from day-to-day -day basis and so i think in the in the dojo and in the dojang in these sacred places we can, we it's like an acting class as well it's the same thing we get to strip off all of that polite garbage and just get down to train you know let it all out and the truth comes out well said yeah and i like arnie as well <laughs> Arnie's got some great lines. It's like, um, you've got to get up and say, I want to be a champion. And I do whatever it takes, the amount of hours it takes, the posing, the this, the that, the visualizing, looking at training footage, looking at motivational books, reading this, reading that, whatever it takes, I will do. That's the answer I want to hear from you. I like that speech because it, it, it kind of gives me a kick up the butt. It's like, it's true, you know, you've got to get up and, and just do whatever it takes. You know, we have, we have that whining voice that's always complaining. And I think sometimes you've just got to knock it out and just, you know, there's a spirit inside of you that actually will do what it takes. Just got to get to know it, you know. And so that's why I think, yeah, these, these people um, um, have been there and they, they understand that spirit and that fire. They're the people I want to listen to. <laughs> I'm going to guess that if I was to take a look at your YouTube account your and, and look at the watch again stuff on the personal side, <laughs> it's probably a, a very similar <laughs> list to mine. Because, right, right. You know, I, I have those days. It's like, okay, I, I got to get fired up or, you know, something just happened. And, and yeah, I mean, I know every speech, I, I can't articulate it as eloquently. I'm not going to sound nearly as cool saying it as you just did, but I know every speech that you just said. Because oh, I've heard them, you know oh, them? <laughs> oh, 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 without a doubt, without a doubt. Yeah. 
Uh, you're oh, wow. you're so the you're the actor same. here, not me. So <laughs> your delivery is far and away better than mine. I love it. <laughs> I love it. It's funny. If you could train yeah. with somebody you haven't yet, I mean, you you talked about you know how influential Benny's been and and your instructors have been and your family, but if there's somebody else, and and we can say it's somebody that's alive now or somebody that's passed away, who would you want to train with? Definitely Bruce Lee. I mean, for obvious reasons, but uh, he has been a big influence on my life. I mean, that whole wanting to change different martial arts and go to Capoeira. Um, one of his quotes is like, a belt is just there to hold up your pants. That has been a really influential quote in my life. Um, and, you know, being like water, you know, and these things that um, come from him. Um, again, it's just that stripping away the ego and, um and also he was an actor and so he could show uh, a, a lot of vulnerability and facial expression and, and physical presence. I'd, I'd love to hear his take on incorporating his acting training and experience into martial arts. Um, that would be something I'd, I'd be really interested in. Yeah. Cool. Let's talk about competition. You and I yeah. talked a little bit about competition before we, we started going. So yeah, have you competed well, this is a great story, and this is the story I've been holding out for. All right, all right. <laughs> it's like, I'm... all right. What happened was, so I told you how I, I, I recently took it upon myself to regrade, right, for a black belt um, to to be under WTF, right. and um, um, that that came about after doing the capoeira and after um going to LA and, and coming back and wanting, I wasn't, when I was doing the comedy in, in, in Los Angeles, I wasn't really doing a lot of martial art training. I decided just for that year, just to focus more on acting. I, I, I was, um, me, me, I, I did fall into a group of martial artists and said, no, just for this year, like just, you know, I just wanted to just experience the acting and the writing directing. And so I would go hiking and, um, and, and did a bit of martial art training just on my own, but I wasn't as intense. But when I came back, I was craving to get back into, uh, uh, you know, proper training. And, uh, this was like 2014, I think. And so I, um, I found a, a club nearby and, um, it was WTF and I just slowly discovered that my certificate was not under WTF, you know, um, as I showed the master, he's like, Oh no, I don't think this is cookie one. And I, I didn't really know about the whole systems or anything. So, um, uh, he took me under his wing and, um, he's a great, great, great master. And, uh, you know, he did Poom say as well and did forms and I was really enjoying it there. And they invited me uh, to go on a training trip to South Korea and I was like, oh, that sounds fabulous. It was a fully packed itinerary of events and things. And um, oh, we, got, we just got the itinerary just a couple of days before we left. And it was like four or five of us martial artists on the trip. And um, uh, one of the, the first event was when we arrived on the, the, the next day we arrived was a tournament. And you know, we, I had never been in like a, a official tournament before. So I, I was just thinking, Oh, you know, is this, is this for real? Like what's, you know, what is it about? And he's, it was the air force championships in Jinju. And, um, um, I, some of, some people started like freaking out with, Oh, I'm not going to freak out. Like the fact that I've, I'm, I'm prepared to travel and get on a plane. Like I'm up for anything. Like if I'm, you know, going to travel, I'm just up for anything. So I was keeping pretty cool about it. And so it was like four or five, f five o'clock in the morning, the next, um, the next day we arrived, we get into a mini bus. It's four hours from Seoul to Jinju, these air force championships. And, you know, it was, I was posting it on my social media. It was like a full on, uh, like professional event. And, we were in uh, a, 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 we were in a match um, with like the weight division that we were in, and I had one fight, and if I won it, I won that division, and I won. <laughs> I couldn't, I, I really could not believe it. I was, it was a life changing experience for me that like started to make me see competition as maybe not such a scary thing because I'd always sort of written it off as maybe oh that was that would be, you know that'd be too scary. For for me to do, or I didn't, like I said, I didn't really come from a uh, competition background, you know, with my martial art, they weren't you know, going into competitions or anything like that. So, um, uh, but I was, I was addicted. Like when I was out there on the mats, 
and uh, and and I was in in the fight. There was a moment there where I was like, I've I, I, I'm hooked. I've got to do this again. And um, I just knew then and there that like this is something that I want to do. And so when I came back and I've been training under that club for a while, um, there weren't enough people like the other people um, that I went training with. I mean, they loved the experience and we had a great time with so many other things on the training trip we did. We went to a temple and studied um, Buddhism and meditation with um, uh, Buddhist nuns. And that was, you know, that was a fantastic experience. I just felt like something from a movie. Um, and these were all things that I was documenting and filming and, uh, and people that um, have seen Ninja Girl Payback, my first five episodes of that web series, I have intertwined a lot of those experiences into that show. Um, but, yeah, when um, I came back and there's just not enough people that are in the club that want to register and do the competitions here. So I have found a club at the moment that is a competition club and I've just been training every single day and um, ready to, to do the competition thing next year. So it's really exciting. Cool. Well, you'll have to let me know. I'll, I'll have to see how you're doing with that. We can let all the listeners know how your competition immersion goes yeah 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 but I think if anything so far like now and this is the, the, the training that I've been doing the last couple months um has 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 gone to a different level you know one I've had to prove myself in this new club where there are competitors and that have got titles so you know I've been um I've been doing double sessions and this one session is already intense. So, you know, sticking and doing the, 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 I've been compounding my training, like just doing more and more and more as my, and, and pushing myself because, um, one thing I did notice uh, when I was in that particular tournament is, you know, it's the stamina is different. You know, I just thought if I was with a competitor, perhaps that had better stamina, how could the fight have gone? So I'm very aware of, you know, having good stamina. And so I've just been for myself, um, just, just training harder than I've ever trained before <laughs> to the point where I just, you know, I just, and it's, it's not, you know, anyone can just put in a, a, a training session, you know, once or twice, three times a week, and you're doing it every day in the double sessions and like backing it up the next day and you're tight, you know, this is, it's different. It's different, you know? And uh, so I'm actually enjoying that side of it of just, and this is where all the Eric Thomas is coming in now <laughs> because yeah, like it's just, um, um, re- you know, learning ways in, you know, proving ways to recover my body and to, and to go back and to um, do it again. And, and yeah, just, I think what, where, where I'm going now with my training, it's a bit different before is um, I think like now I'm like to the point where, it's got to be blood, sweat and tears, you know, you've got to, when you're training, there's a point where you will feel like crying, man, you got to just shed that, shed that tear. Cause that's something that could, could hold you back. You know, that's a, that's a moment where you're like, Oh, I don't want people to see me, you know, cry over this exercise. Well, you know, it, how will you know how far you can go if you don't let out that emotion, you don't let out that, you know, those, that experience, you know? Mm. Yeah, so that's what I'm really enjoying about the idea of competition. It's just it's pushing me now to to go to different levels. Yeah. And that's one of my favorite things about competition. And certainly it's not for everyone. We've had a number of discussions on the show about the pros and cons of competition. But for right. for some yeah. of us, maybe not all of us, but for at least a good chunk of us, and I put myself in this boat, I'm better when I have a reason to get better. Yes, you know, and there's something that's I what can I'm articulate. enjoying now. Yeah. yeah, like I wouldn't be doing these double sessions if it wasn't for this idea, you know, and I just went to, uh, to the August one. I, um, um, my, my coach said I'm too new to go into it, so I didn't go into it, but I went and I spectated the whole event. And just I, I really enjoyed actually watching and seeing how the, uh, you know, different athletes prepare. Some, you know, were listening to music all day. Some were freaking out. Some were, you know, just seeing all the vibes and feeling all the nervousness and and watching was actually a really good experience. And just thinking to myself, this is important for me. And I was videoing, you know, with my my, my phone and everything. Um, some competitors that I may or may not be competing against, but just the whole um, experience of visualizing 
just that alone, I was like, that this is an enjoyable experience, you know, putting myself in outside of my comfort zone and, and you know, seeing myself maybe doing this six months' time, giving myself that goal and really enjoying each step now of, like, observing other martial artists, how are they preparing and gaining a lot of valuable tips than I wouldn't have before, really. You know, I'm, my, I'm broadening my horizons and uh, opening my eyes up to see, um, uh, yeah, just, just, just various preparations, various styles, and um, and yeah, it's just, just seeing it from a, from a different perspective. And I think you're more honest with yourself as well. Like before, when I was sparring, I might have thought that I was, well, I definitely was thought that I was better than what I was. But when you are thinking that you're going into competition, there's no room for cockiness. You know, there's no room. You've got to always, I think, um, be a little, you know, train as if you aren't the best, you know. Now, this next question, I'm always intrigued by the guests that we have that are actors. Yeah. And the way they answer it versus the rest of us that, that aren't. Do you have a favorite martial arts movie? Um, yeah, I do. I love a lot like Bruce Lee movies. So my favorite one is Enter the Dragon. I don't know if that's what you're expecting. <laughs> um, my, and I also, like I said before, Van Damme's Bloodsport and Kickboxer and Karate Kid's a classic film. Um, but I also, there's, you know, a soft spot with me is um, Million Dollar Baby. Um, mm. It's not obviously for a martial arts spectacle, but, you know, I think that, there was something in the script and Hilary Swank's character that there was a real heartbeat there that was quite memorable and Clint Eastwood and Morgan Freeman and the way it was narrated. I, there's something, there's just some lines in that film that I really related to, you know, when she's on the bus and she's on the way to training and there's a dream that no one else can see. I think that 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 film um, definitely, like, resonated with me. Mm. It's a powerful film and anybody yeah. that hasn't seen it, you know, it's it's not a martial arts movie in the traditional sense. No, it's but, not, is it? Yeah. But there's certainly there's some martial spirit to it. It 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 follows some similar story arcs that you know we're used to in a lot of those films. But mm -hmm. it certainly doesn't have the outcome. You know, without giving anything away, it doesn't oh, have the yeah, outcome yeah, exactly. that you yeah. that you yeah, typically see in a martial I... arts film. You're right, because I think when I, when I do look back fondly on it in my memory, I'm mainly thinking of those earlier scenes. Yeah, and I'm, I'm <laughs> um, and I think the way I think her journey of just, especially on the bus and and being alone at night, I, I just saw myself, you know, in that because I just really related to that. Like I was said before about the travel, you know, travel and on the way there because. You know, and I think a lot of people can relate to that, um, you know, traveling to where you've got to go, whether it's the gym for some people, but there is, there's always going to be, or, you know, even when you leave home, there's always that voice that's trying to talk yourself out of it all the time, you know, and I think that um, in, in some of those monologues that, you know, Hilary Swank had and those, it, it was really addressing some of that confrontation of like, you know, whether she was too, too old to train or whether she was, um, you know, she, she came from a poor background or she didn't have the right family. There was all of that going on in the back of her mind. And I think that that was, um, very martial art, martial art, like, um, plot driven in that sense that, you know, the character and the protagonist had, um, you know, certain drawbacks that, you know, she was the underdog. And I think that that, um, resonated. Hmm. How about actors? You mentioned your love for Bruce Lee. So yeah. I'm going to guess he's, he would <laughs> no be more, your favorite. Yeah. yeah. Who, who else is on the list? A lot of times. I love Donnie Yen. I think he's fantastic. Um, and I like, um, I like Jackie Chan. I think that the way he mixes it all up with some slapstick and um, makes it fun. And, you know, um, he has that, the Chinese opera background. I love that. And I love Jet Li. Um, I, I like seeing Cynthia Rothrock in, so in, in her fight scenes. Um, and uh, some of my favorite girl-girl fight scenes are Yukari Oshima and Moon Lee. Mm. I think they're, they're extraordinary. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think that I also liked Uma Thurman in Kill Bill. You know, I think that she, um, there's some, she had a physical presence in, in that film that I think was, you know, carried it all the way through. Even though she's not like a martial artist, um, 
I think the way it was we filmed and obviously with Quentin Tarantino's all of his mixed styles and mixing all the different genres, I think that, that you know, um, for, for a Western woman in martial art cinema, it was, it was exciting, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. An amazing performance. Mm. What about books? We often have some good conversation about martial arts books on this show. That... Yeah. Um, well, I mentioned Benny the Jet, so I like the Jet, his, <laughs> his book. <laughs> and um, um, Ronda Rousey's film, uh, book, I, I really enjoyed. I thought, thought, thought that was really um, motivating. And just, just a book that I'm reading now, because um, I met Nadine Champion um, in – when I was training with Benny and she's just recently come out with a book called 10 seconds of courage. So I'm reading that now and that's really inspirational. Um, but yeah, I think I'm a bit more into the acting book side of things. Um, I, I've mentioned a lot about, you know, ego and cause ego in, in acting is just so important, you know, like as an actor in, in, in acting training, um, you want to get rid of your own ego as much as possible so that way you can relate to, like, a variety of different characters. So I have a lot of books on um, Grotowski and um, and stripping, being able to strip away masks and so, uh, social daily masks and being able to um, be neutral and feel the actor's calling. And I apply that also to, like, feeling the martial art calling. You know, in Grotowski's theatre he talks about um, – about feeling the calling and when you're feeling feeling the calling you're actually in a neutral state you know you know your ego is not involved and you can have a direct communication with channeling that character and also I feel that way in in martial arts I feel like if my my heart's open and I'm like uh, I feel like my I'm, I feel the calling to be a martial artist I feel more genuine. I feel uh, a lot more safe, uh, like safe as well, like because there's always a risk of injury in martial arts. But I feel like if you tap into that, that calling of being a martial artist and you're in alignment with your heart and being open, you have better balance. You know, you have better, um, a better your your senses are much more open to hearing and to sensing the other person, reading your opponent. So I think that, like, um, yeah, a lot of my books are. Are, are, are about acting and are about um, spirituality and connecting with your truth and um, feeling called and your purpose and that sort of thing. Mm. Good stuff. Yeah. And what's the future hold for you? What What do you got going on? What do you? You talked about <laughs> competition next year, but what else are you yeah. looking up to? Yeah. So yeah, I am heavily focused on that uh, Australian state championships. Uh, next year and but I'm also I focused on my own web series Ninja Girl Payback which is um, about um, a rejected superhero from the superhero factory for being too angry too violent and too stressed and now very bitter she seeks revenge and that's that's been a web series which is like um, uh, has been on YouTube and I uh, have five episodes of that and then um, I have had a bit of a hiatus, but I plan on kind of getting back to that and and making more episodes and bringing more people in to coordinate some fight scenes. And, um, yeah, so I've got that going on too. Nice. And, of course, we'll link to that and, you know, everything else you've got going on, social media and everything at the show notes, which we'll have at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for anybody that might be new to the show. Cool. And if people want to follow you, if they want to get in touch with you, you know, yeah. how, how do they do that? Yeah, I, I post regularly on Instagram and um, I check direct messages on there all the time. And so my handle's my name, Sasha Rayburn. And um, yeah, I'm on Facebook and Twitter so that people can contact me on those two mo social media sites as well. Yeah. And email, of course. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I thank you for coming on. Thanks for, for sharing everything. And I'm hoping you Oh, might, yeah. You're welcome. You, thank you. <laughs> hoping you might send us out with some, some great parting words, some advice for the listeners. Yeah, sure. Um, I, would, I would say to, um, wow, think about getting out of your comfort zone and 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 not necessarily like putting more armor on as a martial artist. I think like taking the armor off 
and 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 feeling exposed is actually more strength than having to um, to to shut yourself off because I think if you truly can be aware of your own emotions and know your own emotions then you're able to quickly handle and and deal with those emotions but if you're not willing to uh to strip off your own armor and to get to know yourself then um you're you're more you're more in the control of the of the other person, of the other opponent, of of what's coming at you all the time. That applies to life as well. But if you take more of a spiritual attitude of of stripping off, stripping your um your armor off, and and being okay with things like you know being okay with vulnerability and being okay with um with crying and bleeding and sweating in class and not caring about what anybody thinks because it's your journey you know this is where you're getting the most out of it and you're getting to learn about who you are while you're training it's your time and so don't hold back you know let yourself let that guard just go loud key hops <laughs> help as well sensei rayburn is truly a multi-talented woman who puts her all into everything she does she has an unrelenting passion for performing which i find inspiring I really enjoyed our conversation because of her colorful and dynamic personality. Thank you, Sensei Rayburn, for coming on the show. Don't forget, you can find links to everything that Sensei Rayburn has going on, her web series, as well as photos, links, social media, you name it. It's all over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find our social media at Whistlekick everywhere you might imagine. And you can check out everything that we make at whistlekick.com. Hope you do. Don't forget to sign up for the newsletter. You can do that at whistlekick.com or whistlekickmartialartsradio.com because we like to give you choices. Thanks for spending some time with me today. I appreciate that. Hope the rest of your day, the rest of your week goes amazingly. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.